Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and if you haven't been living under a rock, you're probably aware that Russia has invaded Ukraine, and that the Ukrainians are doing a fantastic, uh, a really, to most people, very surprisingly effective job of stymieing uh, Russian advance into Ukraine. They're, they're doing a phenomenal job. And I think that there are some really interesting implications for civilian firearms ownership and civilian rifle, well, practice, marksmanship, competition in particular, uh, as a result of what we're seeing in Ukraine right now. So I'd like to take a minute to talk about that, because I think it's potentially very interesting. Um, but first, the Ukrainians absolutely deserve all of our help and support, and there are actually a couple of very easy ways that you can help them should you be so inclined. Uh, when the invasion started, the National Bank of Ukraine actually opened up a couple of special accounts uh, for fundraising specifically. So these are accounts that go directly to the Ukrainian government. Uh, they don't go through any sort of middleman. They have one account that specifically goes to the Ukrainian military, if you would like to financially assist the Ukrainian military. They have another that is specifically for humanitarian aid that goes to uh, the Ukrainian, um, essentially, humanitarian ministry. Uh, and I will have links to both of those accounts uh, down below. They have all of the bank routing information you need, and they also have simple credit card processing set up directly on the Bank of Ukraine website. You can donate in 30 seconds with a click of a mouse. Now, if you would like something that is perhaps more of a middle ground between a specifically military and a humanitarian option, uh, or if you would specifically like something that isn't uh, the Ukrainian government directly, I would recommend a charity called Come Back Alive. This is a Ukrainian organization that was established back in 2014 with the first Russian invasion of eastern Ukraine, and they focus on assisting the military with not actually weapons-related aid. They started off with uh, ballistic vests, helmets, uh, and expanded into things like uh, reconnaissance drones, um, night vision, thermal vision, that sort of equipment. They've been around for eight years now. They're a very well recognized charity and they've done a tremendous amount of good. And uh, either they or either of those two Ukrainian government accounts are fantastic ways that you can actually help make a difference. But now let's get on to the specific subject of today's video, and that is to get the main point right out there in front, I think there is a significant chance that we will see a significant expansion in civilian ownership of small arms in Europe as a result of this conflict with NATO. And specifically, I think, and I hope, uh, it will result in an increase in civilian interest in marksmanship, in firearms competency, specifically with rifles. And I think there are some places that we can look to as a really good example of this. And, well, to back up a step, there are countries, I don't think this is a big deal for, a big likelihood for some of the larger and more Western European countries like France, Spain, Germany, countries that don't, still don't see any legitimate possibility of being invaded by someone like Russia. However, there are a lot of small countries, especially in the southern and eastern areas of Europe, th for whom that may not have been a plausible scenario two weeks ago, but it's kind of looking like one now. And if you are a small country close to the borders of Russia, you're in this difficult defensive position of none of these countries have a, a military that can with a straight face suggests that it could simply uh, put up a toe-to-toe, -to -toe, stand their ground, fight and defeat a military the size of the Russian army. Russia's social media portrayed performance in Ukraine notwithstanding. Uh, and yet you want, you have to provide some sort of uh, plausible threat to an occupier, to an invader like Russia, to avoid being invaded in the first place. Like the whole point, the, the best possible success in repulsing an invasion is to not get invaded in the first place. So how can you convince a country like Russia that your very small little uh, republic is not worth invading, is too difficult to invade? 
Um, a lot of these countries are looking around and going, would NATO actually step up and help us directly help defend us in case of an invasion? And maybe NATO would, maybe NATO wouldn't. Uh, how much do you want to depend on that when you know, there's a really good argument to be made that a, a potentially nuclear war between Russia and NATO is not going to help well, it, it wouldn't make the situation in Ukraine any better, would it? Um, for all the tragedy that is the invasion of Ukraine, nuclear war across Europe isn't going to solve that problem. And hence we see NATO being very explicit that while it's willing to support the Ukrainian armed forces, it is not willing to actually deploy its own armed forces and potentially escalate the, the scale of this war. And so we're back to small countries. How can they how can they make themselves a little bit uh, harder of a target? Well, I think Finland is an excellent example of this. Uh, the Finnish military is professional, it is very good, it is also in no way large enough to take on uh, the Russian army toe-to-toe, -to -toe, and they know it. However, Finns have a significant uh, reserve component to their military. They have uh, mandatory military service and reserve service. And one of the things that we see in Finland is a significant, perhaps not as significant as in the United States, but a significant interest in civilian martial firearms practice, use, and ownership. And in Finland this is built around the sport shooting community, and specifically around uh, things like IPSC and rifle, uh, IPSC rifle competition, three-gun competition. There is a specific division, uh, a specific or sub-organization basically, uh, called SRA, which is the reserve, essentially reservist shooting society. And it is, it's actually technically in some cases four-gun, rifle, pistol, shotgun, and precision rifle, and it in competition it requires competitors to essentially carry a military loadout. They have to wear armor, uh, they have to carry water, they have to carry a minimum amount of ammunition during the stages. It's, it's equivalent to what we have in a lot of the US, or similar to what we have in a lot of the US competitions, uh, division of, uh, armored division, and it's specifically to encourage military readiness, but it's not, you know, it, it's not drill sergeants on weekends, it is military readiness in an enjoyable civilian competition format. And what it does is build a broad base of civilian firearms competency that it brings to mind the, the quote from, uh, I think it was Yamamoto, that you couldn't invade the United States, there would be a rifle behind every blade of grass. Well, there would be a rifle behind every snow-covered pine tree in Finland, and uh, the Soviet Union discovered that in 1939 when they did invade. But you saw in the very opening days of the invasion, the Ukrainian government changed its laws abruptly and quickly to allow civilian possession of essentially combat rifles. And then we saw on social media some instances of handing out AKs to anyone who was willing to take one um, for essentially civil defense purposes. I suspect, and I to be honest, I hope, that this situation encourages that sort of civilian preparedness attitude through much more of Europe. An idea, a recognition that having a large uh, community of competent civilian marksmen is something that can contribute a, a very real deterrent to invasion, while at the same time not costing the government a single penny. It is something that the civilian population is quite happy to fund entirely on their own. Uh, in fact, part of the reason I have all the various firearms here, this is a Finnish 2830. There was a program in Finland in the 1930s where you could take your obsolete Civil Guard issued rifle, which was owned by the Civil Guard, and if you wanted it to be a better rifle, both for your own Civil Guard duties and for competition, you could pay about half the cost of uh, upgrading, either upgrading that rifle to the better standard or replacing it, if it was a, an old M91, uh, replacing it with a brand new M2830, which was, by the way, an outstanding rifle and uh, did the bulk of the 
frontline rifle work uh, in the Winter War, or not the bulk, but was substantially present in the Winter War and very well liked. And a lot of that was funded by the individual members of the Finnish Civil Guard. Uh, we see, you know, obviously there are always people who are talking about how um, civilian ownership of a rifle has no 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 value in terms in in true military terms. You know, what are you going to do? You can shoot your rifle at at an enemy fighter jet. Well, what we're seeing in Ukraine, and frankly, what we have seen in a wide variety of conflicts over the past hundred years, is that well, sure, uh, civilian. Uh, territorial guard, say, isn't going to be able to take down enemy air superiority fighters. Uh, ultimately, occupying a country requires boots on the ground, and uh, in a civilian uh, militia is militia is a bad term to use because it is such a politically loaded term. But um, an organized civilian group can in fact deter and prevent boots on the ground. And we see some of that in Ukrainian cities right now with uh, individual citizens with rifles and Molotov cocktails doing a fairly impressive job of preventing Russian occupation of you know, tight occupied or tight uh, city areas. What is my, my ultimate point here, I suppose, is I think it, the, the situation has become ripe for a lot of countries, especially in Southern and Eastern Europe, to look to perhaps emulate some of the civilian martial tradition uh, that is seen in places like Finland, with a recognition that this can in fact be a, a, a real and an effective deterrent to a military invasion. It's, it's something, of course, that is a fundamental foundation of American firearms rights, but it's not something that has seen a lot of practical applicability in the United States. We're on a continent that is separated by huge oceans um, from anyone who might actually want to invade us. And yet, when we look at a country like Ukraine, uh, that very same concept certainly seems a lot more immediately, uh, <laughs> immediately beneficial. So it, this is something that I've been thinking about as I've been watching the, the footage, the coverage coming out of Ukraine. And, uh, you know, we've seen other instances of it. There have been news articles in the past few months talking about civilian guerrilla training in Estonia, for example. I, I can only imagine that Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia are, are extremely concerned with the current state of Russian uh, foreign affairs. They're in a position where they're very small countries that uh, if Russia decided to invade, I, there may not be anything that NATO could do if Russia was able to uh, cross, you know, to occupy the entire country before NATO figured out a way to land troops. It it could be extremely difficult for NATO to actually do anything, and so um, the idea of the entire populace being armed and capable of using those arms, and it's something that we can that can be done without needing military expenditure. It's something that can become a cultural element. Um, uh, people simply, yes, I, I own a military pattern rifle, whether it's an AR or an AK, and I use it in monthly competition. And we practice things like um, SRA matches that occasionally include more military-oriented tasks, like dummy hand grenade throwing. Um, and physical challenges that are more related to uh, potential military uh, action. Uh, it's certainly also something that has been fundamental to the concept of two-gun, with an, an, a focus on physically physical exertion or, or physically strenuous stages, something that encourage fitness, shooting under stress, and I think that's very applicable in this situation as well. Anyway, uh, once again I've gotten to the point where I'm simply rambling. so. Hopefully this uh, was of some interest to you. I would love to see a renaissance in interest in this sort of uh, civil competition, civil marksmanship program um, play in, in more places outside the United States. Anyway, thanks for watching. Uh, as I said at the beginning, a couple great, very easy places that you can donate to, uh, to assist the Ukrainian war effort. Um, hopefully you'll take a look at those. Thanks for watching.